And thank you, Anne, for the introduction. All right, let's see if we can find some shorebirds. All right. Well, pretty much anyone can find shorebirds at the seashore, um, but it takes a bit more planning and effort to find them in the lower Hudson Valley. For all, there are about 95 species of shorebirds in North America. About 54 of those are found in New York State. And there are about 39 in the lower Hudson region, but it really depends on how you define the region. For this presentation, I'm going to uh, define it as shown in this map, um, the six counties, Dutchess, Ulster, Putnam, Orange, Rockman, and Westchester. And here the number of shorebird species in each county ranges from a high of about 36 in Westchester to a low of 15 in Putnam County. And for simplicity, I'm going to break the presentation into four basic seasons, spring, summer, fall, winter. And let's begin with what's out in the field right now. Um, so we'll start with spring. And spring is the best time to see all five of our nesting inland, inland shorebirds. If you're participating in the New York State Breeding Bird Atlas, uh, now's the time to be out there confirming the shorebirds. Um, a few American woodcock may be present in the area throughout the winter, but look for a peak and arrivals around St. Patrick's Day. So they, they're pretty much in by now. Um, in fact, we ran into a couple the other day. Uh, the males began, begin displaying almost immediately after their arrival. In this photograph, this one was photographed uh, displaying on March 18th, so it couldn't have been there too long. Um, nesting takes place in early March, or late March, sorry, uh, through early July. Woodcock occur in open areas with damp soil and nearby dense vegetation. And the easiest way to find them is to drive around in suitable areas uh, just about dark uh, this time of year and listen for their distinctive paint calls. I and mean, they're pretty easy to hear. So uh, you can locate um, you know, groups of them quite easily. Arriving about the same time are uh, Wilson Snipe. And again, you saw photographs of them around now. Uh, most begin showing up at the beginning of March. And Wilson Snipe is listed as a New York State breeding bird, and rightly so in the northern part of the state. Uh, nesting in the Hudson Valley, however, has only been confirmed in two blocks. Um, during the 19 or the 2000 through 2005 atlas. We see most of our snipe uh, moving through in March and April as they pass through on their way north. Um, then we also pick them up again on their fall southward migration. Um, best locations for finding them I've found have been the Walkill River area, uh, and the black dirt region of Orange County, but there are obviously a, a variety of places you can find them. One of our most common shorebirds is the uh, killdeer. And as with snipe and woodcock, there are small numbers present uh, throughout the year, uh, even throughout the winter, um, but most begin to arrive around mid-February to early March. Uh, nesting begins in late March and ends by late, late July. And the picture that I showed you of the killdeer on a nest was in um, May, May 21st uh, at Piermont Pier. So that was pretty much right in the middle of the nesting period. Uh, trying to confirm killdeer for the uh, Nesting for, uh, for the breeding bird atlas is generally pretty easy. Um, they, they have a very obvious display, distraction display. You can pick up if you get near them or near a nest. Uh, their nests and eggs are frequently right out in the open. Uh, these were laid right on the middle of the tarmac out at um, the old Galeville Airport. 
And the uh, precocial young are easily observed. Uh, sometimes you might mistake them for a, a ball of fuzz blowing in the wind, but uh, they're just out um, pretty obvious. Spotted sandpiper begin to arrive about mid-April. And by this time, they're usually well into their breeding plumage. Nesting occurs late May through late, or early May through late July, uh, near shorelines of freshwaters, you know, around lakes, ponds, rivers, streams. And then the after breeding, the uh, spot, breast spotting begins to fade and eventually they'll molt back to a more of a plain brown and white winter type plumage. Uh, and the, they'll start moving in towards some of the coastal marshes and beaches and shores. Our rarest breeder is the upland sandpiper, and this species overwinters in the su southern portions of South America. It uh, overwinters further south than any of our other um, you know, inland nesters. It's typically the last of our breeders to arrive, typically not arriving till about April or even later. Uh, nesting takes place in late April through mid-June. This thing is only known from a couple of, um, or even suspected only from a couple of very small number of sites in the lower Hudson Valley. Um, look for this species in large open grassland areas. Um, probably the best location is the swamp gum grasslands or the neighboring blue chip horse farms. And actually, the swamp gum grasslands uh, is an excellent location to look for any of the shore nesting shorebirds. Um, grassland supports really all five of our inland nesters, nesting species. Okay, spring is also uh, the time to look for migrating shorebirds. The spring migration window is usually very brief but chasing shorebirds at this time of year can be actually quite rewarding. But before I get into looking at some of the, the spring migrants, um, that might be best to first describe the general annual life cycle of, of at least one of our shorebirds. And I'll use the least sandpiper as an example. It's um, actually one of our most abundant shorebirds and uh, is a good representative of the migrant uh, lifestyle. Uh, the Lee Sandpiper overwintering takes place in the Southern US to Northern South America. You can see the kind of the bluish kind of teal colored spots on the map. And this photograph was a picture of an overwintering individual. It was photographed in Florida. Uh, on May 1st, or February 1st, rather. And his basic plumage is rather drab, light brown on top, you know, basically white on the bottom, uh, breast, belly, undertail coverts. But also notice on the, um, the, the feathers, the scapulars and the coverts here, there's a, a thin black median stripe or rib through the, the feathers. And that's pretty indicative of a lot of the winter plumage of shorebirds. Okay. By late April, May, adults are passing through the lower Hudson, heading north to their nesting sites in the Arctic, subarctic, basically this red area up near the, the uh, Arctic Ocean. Migrants will use the, the um, central, the Mississippi, uh, Atlantic, or even the oceanic flyways, uh, depending on the, their location of their overwintering site. Uh, and at this time of the year, these birds are really uh, highly driven to make a rapid directed northward movement um, along those pathways. Um, we don't see large numbers at this time um, primarily because they move through um, rather quickly. And at this point, um, they're molting into their breeding or alternate plumage. 
And you can see on the feathers here, the large dark centers. You don't see that, that uh, medial stripe anymore, that uh, the feathers have become kind of blotchy with uh, dark spots. Okay. By late May, early July, nesting takes place in the far north regions of Canada and Alaska. Uh, this particular one was photographed in Churchill, Manitoba. And you can see the, the dark blotching in the feathers. And also, it, it's hard to see in here, but the, the pretty crisp edges on the feathers. It's really just gone and they're finished. It's um, breeding molt. Okay. Uh, adult females begin moving south uh, after breeding around July 1st. Um, males usually begin you know, up to about two weeks later than that. Um, and the re returning adults generally follow the same pathways that they, they came up. Um, so the central uh, Mississippi, Atlantic, and um, Oceanic. By this time, the, their feathers are starting to show a lot of wear, even some signs of molting. And they'll generally have a, a fairly shabby appearance when they appear in our area. So what we'll see is this um, building trend of birds, which is actually the first part of this peak is um, the return of the adults. Uh, well, first the adult females, then the adult males. Um, about two weeks later, after the, the males, the, the uh, juveniles begin coming down, passing through our areas, and that uh, forms the, the kind of descending leg of this, this um, you know, group of uh, birds. And the juveniles, um, they are less directed in their, their um, return flights, the, the really pass through over a very broad front, uh, not like the adults They're coming through the very uh, restricted areas. Um, they've also molted at this time, uh, fresh molt. So they usually have nice, crisp, clean feathers. A lot of times they'll show rufous, rufous uh, highlights, uh, although that'll fade fairly quickly. Okay, so a number of those small Calidris sandpipers, like these semi-palmated sandpipers, follow the same type of um, migration patterns. Uh, sometimes there's some minor variations or obviously different overwintering areas, but th that's the general pattern that we're seeing for most of the shorebirds. Um, and this particular photo was taken in the, one of the staging areas in Delaware Bay uh, where the these birds are making a stop off point, stopping off point. Um, there's a red knot mixed in here and a, a couple ruddy turnstones. Here's a better look at one of the uh, breeding plumage turnstones, male. Um, also moving through at this time are things like, like the greater and lesser yellow legs. And we also get solitary sandpiper passing through as it heads north. Um, they overwinter in uh, South America and Mexico, even in the West Indies. And here's a black-bellied plover in full breeding plumage. But again, most of these don't, don't stay, stay long. They just move on through. So it's, like I said, it's a short window. Right, with most of the shorebirds having already passed through during spring migration, shorebirding in the summer can be pretty slow, uh, at least until you get to late August. Um, but with persistence, you can still find some pretty good birds in midsummer. Um, for instance, the, the young of the local nesting shorebirds may be found, such as this uh, spot, juvenile spotted sandpiper. And the uh, juvenile spotties can be recognized by that extensive buff and black barring at the tips of the uh, wing coverts. 
um, it, they create this kind of wavy pattern that's apparent. Adults of some early nesters or unsuccessful nesters uh, may also return early, uh, maybe into late July, early August. Um, Semi-palmated plover uh, made it back. Um, this is August 19th. Um, it's a bit worn, but still in, uh, still in its breeding plumage. And others like this uh, returning adult semi-palmated sandpiper are uh, pretty well worn by the time they get back. And this one happened to be back July 26th. If you want to find a willet in the lower Hudson Valley, this is probably the best time to do it. Uh, willet are residents in um, the coastal seashore areas uh, during March uh, through September. And then those are these blue bars are labeled shore. And the, the, these are uh, numbers in Westchester, Bronx, New York County. So down, you know, uh, yeah, Long Island Sound and um, that area. Um, there's also a very small number um, that are labeled as inland. Those are the um, Hudson Valley um, birds. So, and basically only from Rockland and Ulster County. It's the only place that we pick them up. Um, now, Eastern Willet, um, nest on Long Island and it seems likely that these these young bird these are young birds that have been starting to disperse. And we should note that we've got actually two forms, distinct forms of willet uh, in our area. Uh, the eastern form, which is more or less a, a north to south migrant, and then we've got a Western form, which is more or less a West to East migrant. Um, yeah, th this was a, a um, composite photo taken in Florida. So this is a, a overwintering area for both forms. Um, this was taken in late March. And when you have this side-by-side -side comparison, they're, they're fairly easy to tell apart. Uh, the, the Eastern Willets are smaller, uh, has a shorter, has shorter, darker legs and a shorter, stouter bill. Um, and the two also have very different breeding plumages. It appears um, also that the Eastern Willet looks like it goes into its breeding plumage or at least molt um, far sooner than the Western. The Western is still in it, its winter plumage. Um, the Eastern at this point is well into its breeding plumage. If you look at the full breeding plumage here, the lower one is the uh, Eastern Willet, whereas the, this upper one um, is Western Willet. Now this is uh, photographed out in California, but it's a very different pattern. So, um, you know, those two are, are really pretty different uh, organisms. Okay, another possibility, another possible find uh, in the lower Hudson Valley is the uh, American oyster catcher. And this is a very much a coastal species like the willet. Um, they nest along the shore of Long Island and the Long Island Sound and including Westchester County. So I guess technically you could count this as our sixth breeding shorebird in our area, but it really has closer ties to the uh, Atlantic coast and the seashore. And so it makes it a little difficult for me to consider them as really being part of the uh, Hudson, you know, lower Hudson Valley community. It's more of a shorebird, seabird. Um, but we do have a, a couple records of oyster catchers occurring in the inland regions. Um, particularly, well, we've got at least three records from Rockland County. Uh, but however, there are no records from Orange, Putnam, or Ulster counties. 
late summer into fall, undoubtedly the most exciting period for shorebird watching. Uh, birds are migrating back south through our area, and they seem to be more leisurely and spend considerably uh, more time feeding. So they, they just linger longer through the area. Um, while we may see a few semi-palmated sandpiper in May and late summer, we see our, our highest numbers in the fall as the juveniles arrive. Um, this is a, a juvenile individual. Um, this is the, in September. Uh, we can find them at Piermont Pier, Grassy Point Marsh, um, Iona Island, or what's called the Salisbury Meadow area. Um, and especially at any locations closer to the coast. So as, especially down in Westchester County. Um, here's a juvenile semi-palmated plover we found uh, resting at Piermont Pier. Uh, Semi-palms are, are fairly common up and down the river. Uh, juvenile greater and lesser yellow legs can be found um, in virtually every lower Hudson um, County. And while uncommon, juvenile black-bellied plover have been reported in every county except Putnam County. Uh, Sanderling is another strong coastal species, but small numbers of individuals have been found in every county, again, except for Putnam. Uh, dowagers are uh, also closely tied to the coastal regions, but uh, and we almost never see them in the spring. You can see from the histogram, there's a few that show up in um, maybe May, but um, for the most part, it's entirely late summer, fall. And based on the eBird records, um, it looks like pretty much anything before mid-September is short-billed dowager. Anything after that is long-billed, but... Um, Given the difficulties and sometimes identifying these, I'm not sure how much you'd be willing to trust that. Um, there are also scattered records of redneck phalarope from all counties except Duchess. Uh, to me, I found that a little surprising that they show up that often. Um, numbers are very low, especially in the spring and late. Uh, for both the spring and the late summer migrations. Um, and again, you might remember that the sex roles are reversed in the, the phalarope. So uh, this is actually the, the female and uh, this is the male. Um, the other two phalaropes are rare, the, the Wilsons and, the, and especially the um, red phalarope, but they, they have been um, cited. And during the fall, the, there's about 10 species that regularly pass through uh, the inland agriculture areas of Orange County's Black Dirt region. Um, most of these species are found throughout the Lower Hudson Valley, but there are four of them that, that are almost exclusively uh, almost exclusive to this agricultural area. Um, and sometimes these birds are, are referred to as grass pipers. Um, and these four are particular are the pectoral sandpiper. Um, we get a few in the spring, but again, mostly in the fall, uh, late summer, fall. Uh, Buff-breasted sandpiper, virtually entirely in the fall. No spring sightings. Um, Baird sandpiper, again, almost no spring sightings, um, relegated primarily to late summer, fall, and same with the American golden plover, um, only just traces in the spring. Um, so all four of these species have several traits in common. And first of all, all four of these overwinter in Southern South America, so way down 
near the tip of South America or mid South America. Uh, they all use the central and Mississippi flyways in the spring. Um, so they don't take the Atlantic. Um, they make very few stops in their migrating um, flights. Um, they may make a stop in the Great Plains uh, for staging, but um, relatively few, few stops. Uh, they're very long distance haul flyers. Um, when they do make a, a stop, a feeding stop, they stop in prairies and grasslands. Uh, and they all nest in the uh, subarctic or very high Arctic regions. And when they leave in the uh, fall, um, June and July, well, late summer, um, they'll, they'll take the central or Mississippi flyway back, except for the golden plover. They'll, they'll actually fly over to the coast, the maritime, uh, Canadian maritime New England regions, and then fly the Atlantic flyway south to South America. Um, when the juveniles leave, however, in August and September, they again, like our example with the um, Lee Sandpiper, they, they cover a, a broader, much broader front, um, you know, not taking these narrow flyways, but they scatter across. Um, except for some reason, they'll avoid the coasts for the most part. And when they stop, uh, they'll usually stop at grasslands or mudflats, um, pasture areas. So if you want to see any of those four species, um, really the place to do it is the black dirt area of Orange County. Uh, that's the place to be. That's the best chance. Uh, there are two other shorebirds in our area that are both rare. Um, but they share a number of traits with the, the grass piper lifestyle. Um, the primary difference is that they don't have that fondness for feeding in prairies and grasslands. They're, they're much more of a shorebird. Um, the first of these is the white rumped sandpiper. This is known to have one of the longest um, migratory flights in the entire bird world. Um, it migrates from the overwintering grounds in southern Argentina and Terra del Fuego up to the very high Arctic uh, for nesting and then returns. Uh, and it makes very few stops uh, along the way. So we're, we're lucky to pick them up in our area at all. The other one is the stilt sandpiper, and it does um, very similar um, where it overwinters in South America and makes long distance flights. Except they come up through Central America and Mexico um, to stage in the Great Plains area and then follow the central flyway up into the high Arctic. Um, and again, the adults will pretty much follow that same path back, but the juveniles will, will spread out more. All right. Winter's the real doldrums of looking for shorebirds, um, but shorebirds are still possible. Um, actually, there are a number of shorebird species that can be found along the seashore in the winter, um, but there are really four species that are the real hallmarks of this time of year. Um, and actually there are three of them in this photograph. I don't know if anybody wants to take a, uh, yeah. I guess with the IDs, but probably become apparent when we, okay, the, the uh, first one um, is Dunlin, and Dunlin can be seen frequenting rocky shores, jetties, or occasionally just loafing on a sandy beach. Uh, they are most frequently seen along seashores where they often congregate or aggregate in large numbers. In the inland areas of the lower Hudson, they are more likely to be seen just as singletons or pairs, you know, very small groups. Um, they have been reported, been reported from all six of our um, lower Hudson counties. Purple sandpiper sometimes occurs in the lower portion of the Hudson Valley as well. Uh, 
It's been reported from several Long Island Sound locations in Westchester County and has showed up at Paramount Pier in Rockland uh, several times over the last 20 years or so. Um, look for them on rock jetties with active wave action. Uh, they are usually seen alone or in small groups, but also um, often they are associated or near, near the Dunlin. Sanderlings are more often found in the fall in the uh, Hudson Valley, but sometimes occur in November through January. Um, usually they're found most often on sandy beaches, uh, especially ones with uh, strong tidal action. And the fourth species, and those first three were all in that, that first photograph I showed, uh, the, the flight. Um, but um, ruddy turnstones can be found along sandy or rocky shorelines where they actively flip over to breeze searching for food. Um, actually, I found this one was at Jones Point, or Jones Beach, rather, um, which has always been a fairly reliable um, New Year's Day location for them. The trick to finding any shorebird in the winter is getting as close as possible to the ocean. Um, any wave action or high salinity keeps the water open and accessible. Um, in the Hudson Valley, the um, Piermont Pier offers probably one of our best opportunities for winter shorebirding, um, short of going to Long Island Sound or the Atlantic shores, beach shores. Only problem is it gets very cold out there, the winter wind coming off the river, so you need to dress for it. Okay, regardless of the season, vagrants and, and accidentals provide some wonderful opportunities and surprises. Uh, there are a number of species straying uh, from their normal areas, and this can happen almost any time. Um, for instance, the uh, piping plover, it's a... Uh, uh, nesting on Long Island um, sandy shores, yet we had one in Lake DeForest in Rockland in March 1966, uh, rather. black neck stilts, common bird in the south and west, um, scarce in the northeast, but we've got three records, uh, one from May, one from August, one from September. Uh, American avocets, another west and south Southern bird, um, still we have scattered sightings from all lower Hudson Valley um, counties, except Putnam and Ulster. Uh, Wimbrel's a, a common coastal species. Uh, it's rarely found inland, but um, we have a number of fall summer rec records from all the counties but Putnam. Marbled Godway is another Western and Southern species. Um, on the East Coast, it normally reaches as far north as southern New Jersey. But we have two records, one in June from Dutchess County and one from August in Westchester County. Uh, Hudson Sonian Godwick, Godwit is an uncommon migrant through the Great Plains, but strays show up in our area during the fall in small numbers. Um, and again, all counties except Putnam. And I, I love this size comparison between the uh, Hudsonian and the uh, long bill, actually short billed Dowager. I mean, it, it's just towers over the Dowager. Uh, Western Sandpiper, and this is a kind of a, a mystery bird, a little complexity going on. It's a Western species with a portion of the population overwintering in the southeastern U.S., mainly from Florida to uh, southern New Jersey. Uh, there are several reports uh, of Westerns from the um, lower Hudson Valley, including two from Lake Tapan in Rockland. Um, these reports were from late August and September. Um, and we're from reliable observers. Um, there are several additional reports for, of Westerns from Westchester and Orange counties. But most experts seem to agree that separating the non-breeding, which the fall birds would be, uh, westerns from semi-palmated sandpipers is extremely difficult, if not nearly impossible. 
Um, so again, I think we've got to take these identifications with maybe a, a bit of grain of salt. And every once in a while, we get some real surprises. Uh, this is a, a rough that showed up in Lake Tapan in August. And there's another one from Marshlands Conservancy in April of 2009. And there is um, this wood sandpiper that seemed to stick around at the Conservancy um, for a short time in October, November in uh, 1990. So as a wrap up, I, I, prepared a um, comparison of some of the most popular eBird spots for each county. Uh, the lists are far com from complete. Um, you know, I'm sure some of you out there know probably some better spots and can you know, fill those in later or during the discussion. But uh, let's start upriver with Dutchess County and uh, um, some of the popular spots are Tiverly Bays, um, Thompson Pond, Buttermilk, Buttercup Farm, Bennings Point, Norrie Point. And um, we generally find four to nine species per location. And they're basically our, what I call our core species list, you know, the, the common species, that um, ones that are more upland rather than tied to coastal areas. Um, Ulster County, and we talked about Schwamgunk a bit already, but um, Kings Point, Great Fly, Ashokan Reservoir, Sleitsburg Spit, uh, Schwamgunk. And species here range from about 12 to 21 per location. And as I had mentioned, we, we find all four of our inland brooding shorebirds. Putnam County, Constitution Marsh, West Point Foundry, um, Barrett Pond. Um, the species range from four to nine per location, and basically the core species list, uh, similar to Dutchess County. And I'm not quite sure I really understand why Putnam is so low. I, I don't know if it's a habitat issue or that it's just not birded with uh, the uh, the pressure that other counties get. Um, maybe somebody can fill in that later. Uh, Orange County, um, you know, Walkill River, six and a half station, Black Dirt region, Stewart State Forest, uh, usually yield anywhere from nine to 24 species per location. Uh, we've got the core species, has grass pipers in the Black Dirt um, and good diversity of migrants. Uh, I should mention the one thing about the black dirt region. Um, if you haven't been there or not familiar with it, um, it's, it's a known, well, it's called black dirt because it has rich organic soil and it. it's, it's famous for its crops, uh, like onions and lettuce. And actually in some cases they've started growing hemp, um, but it's somewhat problematic to bird. Uh, so if you're new to the area, never birded black dirt, uh, I would highly recommend joining, say, a Merns Club trip to the area. Is it, what, what you're up against here are the, the um, Pine Island Nursery. That's a commercial sod farm. Uh, they do allow birders, but you need to check in at the, uh, the main office and got to make sure they're not working out in the fields. Um, like Skinner's Lane is open, but it's a working farm. The, um, you're on these little narrow dirt roads with steep embankments. Um, and the farm equipment, um, well, as one person uh, puts it, uh, the trucks drive through with uh, great, aband great abandon. Um, yeah, the Turtle, Ro Turtle Bay Road is... Uh, um, I have a residential area. Um, it's really only got one parking area. And it has a number of private roads that you can accidentally get onto where you don't want to be. Um, Indiana Road and the Camel Farm they both have, um, well, Camel Farm, which is uh, this down here with the camel, um, has very limited 
parking. There's basically only one place you can park, but um, there are rather irate neighbors that'll come out and uh, chase you off and call the cops until the cops come out and tell the, the neighbor that we are perfectly within our rights to be there. Um, and the old Warren's uh, sod farms, you, know, you need to stay with your car. Um, you know, a lot of traffic, you know, truck traffic, farm, farm traffic going on. So, you know, it, it's kind of an awkward place to visit. And as I said, if you haven't been there before, I'd recommend going with somebody that knows the area. Okay, Rockland uh, County, uh, Piermont, Pier and Marsh, uh, Iona Island Marsh, uh, Lake Tapan, Lake DeForest, Rockland Lake, uh, especially if the, some of those lakes, uh, their water levels down or being drained, and then they become um, magnets for shorebirds. Um, usually range from anywhere from nine to 26 species per location. And again, the core species, but uh, also pick up some of the odd um, coastal species that, that um, kind of come up river a little ways. And then Westchester County, um, uh, Marshlands Conservancy, Croton Point, uh, Railroads Road Station, uh, Edith Reed, Rockefeller, Tarrytown. Uh, and there pick up anywhere from six to 31 species per location and a really good mix of the core species, grassland species, uh, coastal species, uh, migrants, et cetera. So, so overall, probably the best places to go out of the entire uh, Lower Hudson Valley is, are you know, marshland conservancies. And they, not in any real particular order here, but marshland, uh, the black dirt region uh, to get the grass pipers, uh, Piermont Pier, the Wallkill River, uh, Croton Point and the Croton Point Railroad Station, uh, Edith Reed or, um, or Great Vly. And actually the only one of those I haven't been to is Great Vly, but it, it looks like it, it can be pretty productive. Um, and the most likely birds that you'll see, regardless of where you go, are spotted sandpiper, solitary sandpiper, killdeer, greater yellow legs, least sandpipers, yellow, lesser yellow legs, Wilson snipe. Okay, um, two things before I finish. Uh, first of all, daily shorebird activity is often closely associated with local tides. So you should have a tide app um, close at hand so you know, yeah, so you don't get basically, don't get there at the wrong time. Um, generally, you want a lower incoming tide so the birds are actively feeding. Um, but, um, and at high tides, many shorebirds will seek uh, really inaccessible areas for roosting, uh, and you may not be able to get at them. So, as I said, generally, a, a low or rising tide to, to bring in, bring them into you. But there are certainly exceptions to that advice. For example, one of my favorite um, shore birding spots in uh, California is a um, series of freshwater ponds near San Francisco Bay. And at low tides, there was exposed miles of mud flats and the birds were just scattered way out over the entire bay. Um, so there's no way that you could get close, uh, even with a, a scope that was difficult. Um, however, with a high tide, it concentrated them. It chased them off the mud flats, and they would concentrate in these small ponds. And some of them would actively feed, others roost. But you could just sit there and watch them at very close range for that entire period. So you got to know the location and what you're trying to get out of it. And finally, um, a most wanted list. Uh, this is a list of species that have been seen in New York State, but have not been seen in the lower Hudson Valley, at least to date. So you should be on the lookout for these species. Um, and certainly if you see any, um, raise the flag. And with that, 
let's go shorebirding. <laughs>